delving too far into it, basically the reason for that value is if you remember, as concrete gets stronger, it also gets less ductile. And so this is sort of a way of expressing the relationship between, you know, you up your FC prime, and if your FC prime goes up, your ductility goes down. And so that's sort of what beta 1 is doing, is it's accounting uh, for that. Don't worry, we'll delve into that uh, in some pretty significant detail later. Is everybody okay with this so far? All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this example, uh, I'm calling it example 5A because what I want to focus this example on is just the mechanics and getting you all familiar with some of the, the maximum capacity approximations that we use in concrete design. Then we're going to come back to this beam later and look at a lot of the code specific checks like the stuff that ACI makes us check when we look at reinforced concrete beams. Um, so we're going to determine the nominal uh, moment capacity and ultimately the design moment capacity uh, of, this, uh, of this beam. Um, it's a beam that's 10 inches wide. It has an effective depth of 23 inches. Notice I didn't tell you how overall tall the beam is. I didn't tell you what H is because it honestly doesn't matter. Um, uh, as you're going to see here in a little bit, the capacity, I mean, you can even look at the equation here, but the capacity has nothing to do with the height of the beam. It has to do with that effective depth. And the reason why is because it's all about moment arms, and we'll talk about that later. But these two expressions that you see here on the board, we're going to derive these here in, a, here in a quick second. One of the things about concrete design is um, these equations that you see here on the board are not equations that you can look up in the code. These are equations that you kind of have to derive. And the reason why is because concrete beams can take on any shape, any cross section. They can be rectangular, they can be T-shaped, they can be whatever. And so your equation that maps your capacity has to be a function of that. And so you, know, you don't get married to a specific equation, I guess I would say. But by and large, that's one of the most common ones. Okay. So let me copy this every time. All right, that's good now. Okay. We'll just call this example five, because like I said, we're going to come back to this example uh, later on and, uh, and assess this. Now, if I remember for this example, it's, was it 4 KSI? Okay. So, this is a, 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 a beam that has a concrete, a 4,000 PSI concrete. Um, now, this doesn't really matter right now, but I'll go ahead and tell you that because FC prime is 4,000 psi, this means that beta 1 is 0 0.85. That doesn't really matter so much for this first part of the example, but it'll matter later. Um, uh, if we had normal weight concrete, what would that mean? If we had 4,000 psi concrete and I told you it was normal weight, what would that tell you? Lambda is one, right? Lambda is your lightweight aggregate factor. Now, now here's the thing. Um, lambda affects really your stage one and your stage two behavior because lambda one tells you what your modulus of rupture is, which will ultimately tell you what your cracking moment is, and that'll tell you whether or not your beam is cracked or uncracked de depending upon a given moment that you put on. But we're not really looking at that right now. What we're looking at is, okay, what is the absolute maximum moment that you can put on this thing before it busts. Okay, That's what we're looking at here, the absolute maximum nominal moment capacity. So whether or not it's normal weight concrete, it doesn't really matter. Ultimately, all we really care about is the PSI or the FC prime. Now, keep in mind that 4,000 PSI is the same as 4 KSI. Um, another thing to note is that this um, steel down here is grade 60. So anytime that you see grade 60 steel, grade 60 has a yield stress of 60,000 PSI or a yield stress of 60 KSI. Okay. Now I'll tell you, unless I say otherwise, uh, and some problems will, I mean that, that'll happen throughout the, this course and on homeworks and on exams, but unless otherwise stated, 
Those are probably the most default material properties that we use in reinforced concrete design. The regular old normal concrete has an FC prime of 4 KSI and the yield stress of regular old rebar is 60 KSI. Now, the that'll change, I'm just talking about when you all get out of here and start practicing and whatnot. That'll change a bit depending upon if you're looking at pre-stressed concrete. You know, we up our FC prime a bit and uh, uh, because of the high forces and, and pre-stressing steel has uh, material properties far higher than this. But by and large, those are pretty common for regular old concrete and regular old rebar. Sound good? Okay. Now, remember, and, and I know that I had this drawn on the board and I'm drawing it again. It's sort of a good habit to get in the habit, or it's sort of a good procedure to draw these stress profiles out because they help you figure out what's going on when the beam isn't of a simple geometry. This is about the simplest beam that we can analyze in reinforced concrete design. It is a rectangular beam. Rectangles mean that the section properties, the, you know, the area, you know, base times height, the moments of inertia, all that's really, really simple to determine. Um, another thing about this beam is that it is singly reinforced. Now, that's the first time I've ever popped that term out. Uh, what do I mean by a singly reinforced beam? Well, a singly reinforced beam is a beam that only has reinforcement in the tensile region. Okay? So if I have a beam and I bend it, let's say it's in smiley face bending, positive bending, the top is experiencing compression, the bottom is experiencing tension. Okay? No matter how much steel I put down here, if I put you know, multiple layers, if I put you know, different pattern, if I only have steel on the bottom, that's considered a singly reinforced beam. If I ever put steel up here, up top, in the compression region, that's called a doubly reinforced section. So doubly reinforced section is when you have steel in the compression range. There are reasons why you would want to do that. Um, it does up your moment capacity a bit and it improves your long-term deflection performance, which we'll talk about later. Uh, but for now, we're going to start simple with uh, singly reinforced sections. So we only have steel uh, in the bottom. So remember, in real life, if this is your beam, okay, so we're going to extend this out a bit. Right. So what would your stress profile look like in real life? Well, in real life, we're going to have a neutral axis somewhere right here. I have no idea where it is, but I know that this dimension right here is C. So if that is C, this dimension here is going to be D minus C. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? All right. That's, that stuff's going to become important here in a little bit when we start looking at strain uh, checks. Now, up top, in reality, again, I've got this nonlinear stress-strain curve applying compression to the section and then on the bottom I've got this tensile force <coughs> which is ASFY. Now is everybody okay with the tensile force? I mean I'm taking the area of steel which is in square inches, and I'm multiplying it by the yield stress, which is in KSI or PSI. So if I take like a KSI and I multiply it by square inches, I get a force in kips or pounds or whatever. So everybody okay with that? And, and that becomes important because we're basically going to use equilibrium, sum of forces, to determine some of these quantities. A lot of this stuff that we do here is based on some pretty fundamental stats. Okay? Now this is what's really going on. Um, what we're going to do to approximate this, remember, is we're going to approximate that nonlinear curve with a stress block that looks something like this. Just a rectangular chunk. Okay. Remember the width. is 0 0.85 FC prime and then the depth of that stress block is A. Okay? And remember, this is just our rule in concrete design to make the analysis pretty simple. Okay? That's our goal. Now actually, actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this A dimension over here. 
we still down here, we still have the same approximation. We still have that. We still have a tensile force, which is the area times that. Now, <clears throat> So in tension, I have the area of steel times Fy. What about in compression? What's my compressive force? So ultimately what I'm trying to determine is this. So C is something. And I'm, I'm sort of writing my C a little funky because I don't want you to think that this C is different or is the same as that. This is just a distance. This is me looking at this force. Now, when I collapse this, I'm going to treat this like I did in structural analysis. Let's go back to structural analysis. Let's say I have a beam. It's, got, it's 30 foot long and it's got two kips per foot. Remember, uh, I could take that distributed load and I could collapse that into a single point load. And I would say, okay, two kips per foot times 30 foot to get a single point load. All right. So I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to sort of erase this, put this over here. And I'm going to say that this compressive force could be that distributed stress times A. But unfortunately, that's not enough. Okay? I can't just say 0.85 FC prime times A. A dead giveaway are the units. Look at the units. If I had FC prime, which is in KSI, and I just multiply it by A, that's going to give me like kips per inch, right? I can't take this kips per inch and compare it to this because it's not the apples to apples comparison. The units don't uh, uh, are copset, okay? So what that means is there's something missing here, okay? Now, I'm going to do my best to draw this in three dimensions, but I want to look at this stress block in three dimensions. Remember, I've got a beam that looks something like this. Okay, that's the beam, right? Now, this part right here will say that that's where the neutral axis is along the beam. And my stress block, it's actually going to look something like this. going to be going in this direction. Does that make sense? So think about it. How far out does it extend? That's the 0.85 FC prime. How deep is it? What's that dimension? Well, that's A. But remember, it goes across the entire width of the beam, so that is B. Does that make sense? Heard somebody say something. What's up? Anybody have a question? I mean, this is the time. This is good stuff. Everybody good? Now, let's let's take a second and take stock of this. Okay? I want to look at this beam. Okay? I'm proposing that there's a tensile force in this beam that's equal to the area of steel times Fy. Okay? I'm proposing that the compressive force in the beam is 0.85 FC prime times the area of that stress block on the face of the beam. So in other words, it's 0.85 FC prime, if I'm looking over here, 0.85 FC prime times that area. Okay? And what's the area of that portion of the beam? What's B wide and A tall? So 0.85 FC prime times A times B. Okay? Now I want to look at these these quantities. Let's take the tensile force. What is the area of the steel for this beam? 2.36. So we know that quantity, right? It's right there. Um, what about Fy? Do we know that? 60 KSI. It's a grade 60 steel. Exactly right. What about the compressive force? Do we know Fc prime? Yeah, it's 4 KSI. Do we know B? You're right. What don't we know? 
We don't know A, okay? And so how do we determine A? Well, we determine A based off of equilibrium, okay? So if I go down here and I say equilibrium, what I'm basically saying is that the compressive force in the beam is 0 0.85 Fc prime AB, and the tensile force is AS Fy, Equilibrium tells me that the force in compression has to equal the force in tension. That's got to be the case, that the total amount of compression in the beam has to equal the total amount of tension in the beam. Otherwise, the beam is running away from you. Okay? Otherwise, the sum of forces aren't zero and we're in dynamics land. And I know you all want to stay away from dynamics land, right? So obviously, we want the beam to sit still. So what that means is 0.85 Fc prime AB equals ASFY and just solve for A. And so how do I solve for A? I divide everything over and I get that A is <coughs> area of steel times FY 0 0.85 Fc prime B. So that's all that this is, okay? That's it. It's, it's not like it's anything special. It's just looking at my assumption, seeing what value I don't know, using equilibrium to solve for X. It's that simple. Okay? So I could go ahead and solve for A right now. I could go ahead and solve for A right now by just plugging and chugging. So what do I have here on the bottom? I have 0 0.85, I have Fc prime, which is 4 KSI, and I have 10 inches, and then I have 2.36 square inches up top, and 60 KSI. And so what this will tell us is how deep that stress block needs to be to achieve equilibrium. And that's really what we're at. that it can experience. This is the concrete right when it's about to fail, right? I mean, we've already gotten into this nonlinear range, so the concrete's experiencing, you know, the maximum stress possible. So all we have to do is look at these forces, which represent the worst case scenarios, and just multiply them by their respective moment arms, okay? Now, so we have a force times a moment arm. Now, if, I'm, if I wanted to draw this in statics land, 
what I'm talking about, let's see if you all remember this from static. So I have a force here and a force here. They're equal and opposite. And so the moment is defined as that force times multiplied by the moment, right? <coughs> Basic status, right? Let me ask you a question. Okay. So let's take the forces. Okay, now I've got a compressive force and a tensile force. Which one do I need to use here? Little bit of a trick question. Didn't we just determine that they're Say it. an equilibrium? So, so it, doesn't that, matter. it doesn't matter. Exactly right. It doesn't matter which one that we use because they're equal, right? Remember, the, the force that we could use is C or T because they're the same force. This value of A that we determine. That's the value of A that is required for them to be equal. So if you computed a compressive force, you would get a value. If you compute a tensile force, you'll get a value. They'll be the same value. Okay? Now, I'm lazy. Okay? So if, if I was writing down a formula to compute moment capacity, would I use C or would I use T? T, T because there's two terms versus four. I'm lazy, so I'm just going to use uh, the one uh, uh, with tension. Now, I'll go ahead and tell you, that actually isn't always going to be the case in here. When we start looking at T-beams and doubly reinforced sections, it'll actually make more sense for us to use the compressive forces just because of the way that we uh, 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 delineate those out. But for now, we're just going to use T because it doesn't really matter. Now, the Z part, that's what we got to ask ourselves, the moment arm. Now, the moment arm is... You know, so we have a force going this way and a force going this way. And so Z is that distance between them. So if you want, looking here on your diagram over here or up here, it doesn't really matter, we could basically say that this distance here, that is our, that's our moment arm right there. From middle of one force to the middle of another. Now let me ask you this, how far is it from this force to that one. What is that perpendicular force? Well, let me ask you this. How far is it from the steel to the top of the beam? 17. No, from the steel to the top of the beam. That's 23. Okay, so from here all the way up there is 23. And so 23 minus what will get you to the compression force, the compressive force? Not quite, close. Half of it? Half of it. So this distance here is the total height or that total effective depth minus A over 2. Does that make sense? Remember, we're going from center of force to center of force. So, the force is either compression or tension. It really doesn't matter. Although, practically, we're going to use tension because it's just less stuff to throw in our calculator. And the moment arm is going to be D minus A over 2. They so, said it was on the board. <laughs> I did, did I? So our moment capacity is just our force times our moment on. And so that's where that formula comes from. It's just, all this is is just a force times a moment on. That's it. So I don't want you to think that there's any mystery to this formula. The reason why I really think this is important is because you as structural engineers need to have the ability to derive these types of equations when you have beams that you know look like this. And that's that's looks like a nightmare, but it really isn't. If you can understand geometry and these basic principles, you could determine the moment capacity of a beam like this just using these basic concepts. In fact, I gave you one on problem five where it's not a rectangle, it's a triangle. And I said, okay, compute the moment capacity of that. And it's all about just geometry and understanding these basic principles.
Once you derive it, the math is pretty simple. Because all you're going to do is take, look at this expression and say, okay, 60 KSI, 2.36 square inches, 23 inches minus 4.165 over 2. And so if you chug that out, what does it come out to be? So divide this by 12, you should get 2 something. 246.83. We'll say 246.8 foot kips. Absolute maximum moment capacity that this thing can withstand. A couple things to keep in mind. If we had computed the cracking moment of a beam like this, we probably would have gotten like 30 foot kips or 40 <laughs> foot kips or something like that. The maximum capacity is far higher than its cracking moment. Okay? That's the first point. The second point is, okay, this given this beam, this is the beam's maximum capacity. What we'll then ask ourselves is, okay. What if I don't know what the beam looks like? How wide does the beam need to be? How deep does the beam need to be? How much steel do I need to put in the beam? How do I configure it so that it has enough capacity to resist, resist whatever loads I'm putting on? That is reinforced concrete design, okay? So we have to start here, given a beam, how do we compute its capacity? And then from that beam, we then determine, okay, uh, 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 or, fr or from that knowledge, how do we size and uh, uh, and, and detail that being important. Does that make sense? All right. Does anybody have any questions on this? This is important stuff. Okay. Now, I skipped a fair amount with this problem because I didn't talk anything about um, this beta term. I didn't talk about full-blown ACI checks. So I want to talk about that. Okay, um, if you recall, what we're doing in this class and what we're doing in structural engineering is a bit twofold. Okay, so what do I mean by that? So remember, we're saying that the resistances have to be greater than or equal to the loads. Okay, in other words, that's how we design period. Okay, that whatever force that we put on the beam has to be less than or equal to how much it can supply before it's going to fail. Right? Now, you all just did homework one, so you have kind of an idea of what I mean by loads. I mean, I give you a frame, I say, you know, here's the column layout, here's live load reduction, and you can tell me what the factored moment is on the beam. That was the whole point of, uh, of homework one. So maybe what I'll do is I'll say, you know, the loads might be represented by something like that, like what you did on homework one. Now, the resistances aren't as simple as just MN. They're MN adjusted by some safety factors. So you, you increase your loads to account for their uncertainty. You also decrease the resistances to account for their uncertainty. And that's what these resistance factors are all about. In steel design, it's really, really simple. You just look it up, and there it is. In here, with beams, there's a little bit more to it. And 999 times out of 1,000, they all end up being the same value. But there's a little bit of a, 
behavioral aspect to it that I want you to understand. But it's not just that. I want to talk about just ACI requirements in general. I want to talk about strain limits, reinforcement limits, the reinforcement ratio in general, uh, and what have you. Okay. So what I'm doing here is I'm going through the ACI spec and just sort of pull out the stuff that I think, or that, that not that I think, that is relevant to you all for, for beams, and then we're going to be using this stuff for the next uh, uh, few weeks. So let's start off with first blanket fundamental assumption, and that's that the strain uh, varies linearly from the neutral axis. Do, do you all remember when I brought in that uh, ACI guide and I had the Sharpie and I drew the, the flat line and when I bent it, it remained a, a straight line? That's the first blanket assumption that ACI allows you to, uh, to make, is that plain, if you ever hear the term plain sections remain plain. Basically what that means is here's the beam before you bend it, here's the beam after you bend it, and in the end it's still a, a flat plane. Um, so this is important because we're going to use this idea to compute strains. So um, we'll be able to take this and compute the strain in, in, let's say, the concrete or the strain in the steel. And those strain values are important because they'll tell us, um, they'll basically tell us whether or not our beam is conforming to, uh, to given standards. Now, one of the ways that we do that is when we're looking at the ultimate stage, when we're looking at the maximum capacity, one of the things that we always assume is a constant is that the strain in the concrete, the absolute tippy-tippy top strain in the concrete at the top of the beam is 0 .003. Okay? That's a constant value. We're going to be using that pretty regularly for the next few weeks. So it's something you might want to you know, lodge into the back of your head. The reason why is that uh, it's a pretty simple value to use, and it works pretty well regardless of what type of grade of concrete that you use. Most of the uh, concretes that you're using for structural applications are going to be 3 KSI or above. And for all of those concretes, 0 .003 is a pretty good maximum usable strain. So our ultimate strain in the top of the beam uh, or if it's in negative bending at the bottom of the beam, but the maximum compressive strain that we're going to be able to use is 0 .003. And so that's a number I want to keep in, want you to keep in the back of your head. Okay, that's point one. Point two. Okay, let's go back to this. So concrete stress of 0.85 FC prime shall be uniformly distributed over a depth of A. And so that's what we have here. So I want to take some time and digest what I have here on the slide. So over here on the left, I have a reinforced concrete beam. It's B wide. It has an effective depth of D, and it has an area of steel there at the bottom. Okay. Now the strain profile is linear. Okay. At the top of the beam, we have a, a, a strain of 0 .003. At the bottom of the beam, I don't really know what that is. I have to compute that because that's a function of a number of things. It's a function of the beam's dimensions. It's a function of the area of steel, the type of materials that we're using, uh, so on and so forth. Okay, So we're going to come back to this here in a bit. Over here on the stress side, I assume that the steel uh, has an area of steel and it reaches the yield stress of the tensile forces ASFY for compression, 0.85 FC prime wide, and A depth, or AD. So the compressive force is 0.85 FC prime AB. Now remember, there is a difference between how deep this stress block is and where we have zero strain. This dimension is this little letter C. This dimension is A. Okay? That's a pretty important uh, uh, concept to keep in the back of your head because we're going to refer to that quite a lot uh, again over these next few weeks. Now what about this beta 1? Okay? If you remember, one of the things I said was that beta 1 um, is a term that basically relates how ductile your, your concrete is. So the idea is that if you have a concrete that has a really, really high compressive strength, it's really, really strong, but it's not very ductile. As such, the stress block doesn't get as deep if you have a section that has uh, extraordinarily high uh, compressive strengths. Any time that you have a, an FC prime less than or equal to 4 KSI or 4,000 PSI, we take beta to be 0.85. Any time that FC prime is over 8,000 PSI, we take beta 1 to be 0.65, and it's just a linear fit in between. So I have here a table. So for instance, if you have 5,000 PSI concrete, that's beta 1, 6,000 PSI, so on and so forth. 
I want to be absolutely crystal clear because this is really easy to mix up when you're when you're doing this uh, these types of problems. So we're going to say this a couple of times. Okay, this is always 0.85. This can change. Okay, we'll say it again. This is always 0.85. This can change. This can change. This is always 0.85. This is always 0.85. That can change. Which can change? That can change. That can change. <laughs> Seriously. So the reason I say that is because if we're always using um, 4 KSI concrete in a lot of our in-class examples, this just happens to also be 0.85. So you're doing a problem on a homework and exam, and I decide to be uh, uh, mean and give you a 7,000 PSI concrete, you say, well, it's always 0.85, and that's wrong. Okay. So remember, this is constant, that can change, okay? So I just want that to, to be burned into the back of your head. Okay, now, let's talk about some other limits that ACI uh, uh, delineates. One of them is on the steel reinforcement. So here's your beam, and I've got this steel reinforcement. Now obviously, I'm gonna provide enough reinforcement in there to resist the load. But sometimes if you have a beam that isn't quite seeing a lot of load, maybe you don't need to provide a lot of steel, ACI says, I don't care what the math says, you're going to put at least this much steel in the beam. Because if not, you could, that, the idea is that if your load happens to increase one day, you could have a sudden failure. Okay? So when, we, when we're uh, designing beams, we're always going to check to make sure that we're at least providing the minimum. More often than not, we will always be providing the minimum and then some. So a common occurrence that we'll get on problems is we'll do the math, and the math says that we, or the, the, the mechanics, the load on the beam, says we need to provide like four and a half square inches of steel, but this equation says we need to provide like 0.8. So we're obviously going to provide more than enough steel to meet this limit, but it's definitely something that you do need to check. Now, when you're looking at the limit, this is a couple things to keep in mind. So the minimum area is the width times the depth divided by Fy multiplied by this, which is the maximum of those two terms. Okay? So 3 times the square root of Fc prime. Somebody tell me what's going on with the square root of Fc prime. You put in PSI, you get out PSI. Okay? So that's one point to keep in mind. Another point to keep in mind is all of this right here is in PSI. That needs to be in PSI as well so that your units cancel appropriately. So that's something to keep in mind. Now, this term B sub W, this term B sub W is when we're looking at a T beam, and that would be the width of the web. But whenever you're looking at a rectangular beam, it's just the width. So um, that's just something to keep in mind. I'll throw that in there now because we are going to look at T-beams. We are going to look at beams of irregular geometry soon, so it's, it's something to keep in the back of your head. Okay. Everybody good so far? Now, so I've got beta 1. I've got A. I can determine C pretty easily. So if I've got, if I've got this beam, I've got A, and I determine what beta 1 is, I can determine C just, just pretty straightforwardly. What about strains? Well, if I know this strain is 0 0.003, and I know this distance C, well, I can determine the strain here pretty easily. Okay, so just, just bear with me. I'm sure you're probably like, why would you care about that? Well, just, just bear with me. So let's look at this like it was ratios, like slope ratios in structural analysis. What do I have, rise over run, or run over rise, however you want to look at it? 0 0.003 is to that distance as that is that distance, right? So 0 0.003 is to C as the strain in the steel is to D minus C. So I can determine the strain in the steel pretty easily. It, that, I, I don't think that that's fairly complicated, right? Are okay with that? Now, why do we care about that? Well, we care about that for a couple of reasons. Um, the first is because um, uh, <clears throat> We need to have an understanding of the beam's ductility as it relates to this. And the second is just because there are strain limits in general that, that we need to understand. Now, let's go back to something I said earlier. Okay? 
We're looking at a reinforced concrete beam. So here's my reinforced concrete beam. One of the things I said earlier is that we're just going to assume that the steel yields, right? I just said that. We're just going to assume that the steel reaches its yield stress. Well, Dr. Mike, how can you just make that assumption? How can you just willy-nilly say that without going back and checking it? I'm not. We are going to go back and check it. Now, now how do you know when the steel yields? How, how do you know that happens? Well, you know that happens when it reaches the yield strain, right? Remember, here's the stress strain curve for steel, right? So that's the strain, that's the stress, and so it sort of goes like that, and then we get into linear land, right? And so that uh, slope is E. What's the E for steel? That's right, 29,000 KSI. And so that's my yield stress. And so this point right here, that's the strain when it yields. And how do I determine the strain when it yields? I just take that divided by the slope. Okay? So what... The overall point was that at the very beginning, we assumed that the steel yielded. We're going to go back and check to see if, in fact, the steel yielded by checking its strain. Now, if I got regular old grade 60 rebar, grade 60 rebar will yield when its strain hits about 0 .002. Okay? So if my strain in my steel is higher than that, then that means that that assumption that I made that the steel yielded is, in fact, a correct assumption. And more often than not, that'll be the case. But if you're ever in design mode, you definitely need to check that. You know, one of the things about design mode is if I look at that beam, there's all sorts of different ways I can configure that beam. I could make it any depth or beam or width that I want. I could put whatever amount of steel in it. Once you have a beam, you need to go back and check to make sure that it's complying with all these, these various uh, limits. Because these limits are intended to ensure that the beam is behaving the way that you assume it will. Okay, and that's what these limits are for. Now, according to ACI, um, what ACI says is that the strain in a given beam, the tensile strain, has to be larger than the strain yield point plus point zero zero three. Which, before I, I continue, remember, all this stuff that I'm throwing at you, don't worry. We're going to check this and go through this in very significant detail. And two, none of what I'm talking about here is going to affect you on the second homework. I'm going to pull the second homework up uh, here in a second. Now, excuse me. So if you have, for instance, a, a, a beam like this, grade uh, 16 rebar and 4 KSI concrete like the beam we just did, um, what this limit is basically saying is that the steel strain has to be greater than or equal to 0 0.005 because the strain at yield is about 0 0.002, so 0 0.002 plus 0 0.003 is 0 0.005. What this if you're wondering what this limit is doing, this limit is basically trying to tell the designer that if you're going to design a beam, the steel has to yield. Okay? They actually want the steel to yield at failure. Now, you, wait a minute. Hold on. Stop. Time out. I'm talking about designing a beam, and the code is telling me that they want the steel to yield. Don't we not want that to happen? Don't we want the beam to not fail, right? Why would the code enforce this limit upon me? Don't we want to know when it fails? Isn't that the point? Basically. Long, long and short of that's exactly right. So, um... Why, why do we enforce this limit? Well, I want to talk about ductile failure versus brittle failure. Okay? Now, I mentioned that uh, you know, while back the steel is a very um, ductile material and uh, uh, concrete is a very brittle material. And after this, I'm going to call it the number one the time. But basically, when steel fails, it's very, very gradual before it fractures. But when concrete fails, it's very brittle. It fails, it fails quick. So as a result, we ensure that the steel reaches a certain strain so that it will fail before the concrete does. Now, we're running out of time, so I don't want, I don't want to you know, dive too deep into this. I do want to pull something up real quick, because you all have a homework due on Wednesday. So this is homework two. Let's open. Okay. So there's two problems at the end that we didn't have time to cover last week. So this is problem four and five. Problem four, if you understood that what we did today, you could probably do problem four in about five minutes.
because it's basically just compute MN for this beam. So it's going to be very, very similar to what we just did. It's almost a free throw problem. However, this one's a little unique. Okay, um, This is me testing your understanding of what we did today. So here we have a beam that is, has a triangular cross-section. So remember, this is your neutral axis, and that's your, um, your depth of your stress block. You need to derive what is A and what is MN for this beam. Okay? I've given you a hint. First, determine the width of the bottom of the stress block. So how wide is the stress block right here? And if you can derive a formula for that, it should go a little smoother. But that's where I would start. But the idea is to derive a formula for this. And if it seems like, oh, God, he's making us derive stuff, I'm telling you, when you have problems that are far more complicated, like you would in real life, this is child's place. This is sort of where it starts. And if you have a column that's being bent due to wind and seismic, you can have a triangle across it. That's so. what I was <laughs> Yeah, you can't see it in real life, too. So, so yeah. Any questions? Yes? On well, number four, do we use T and C? As equilibrium, like we did in five Absolutely. Yes. Same. And you're going to use compression equals tension for the next few weeks. Whether we look at slabs, doubly reinforced sections, T beams, it's all going to be the same story. So it stops becoming that when we start looking at shear and deflections and things like that. But C equals T is going to be our livelihood probably for the next four weeks or so. Definitely through the first exam. Sound good? Yes. I mean, just personal. Um, are you being the office tomorrow? Yeah, I'll be here. I'll be in and out. Okay. I may ask you about the afternoon. We'll be easy. All right. That's all I got, everybody.